My name is David De La Puente. I'm a senior political analyst at Third Way, which is hosting to the panel, How and Why the Latino Vote Shit 2020. I am joined today by three of the smartest people in democratic politics who also happen to be Hispanic or Latino themselves. Combined, their resumes and accolades would be enough to fill our entire hour. So I'll give short introductions before we jump into the discussion and they will talk more about their experience and expertise. I am joined today by Stephanie Valencia, co-founder of Equis Labs, Matt Pareto, co-founder of BSP Research, and Dan Senna, or at Senna, our strategies. Thank you all for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Stephanie, yeah. Stephanie let's start with you. Uh, but with every question, we want to we want everyone to jump in uh, as as we go through these questions. Stephanie, the most fundamental question uh, is: with the data we have available in March twenty twenty one, what do we know so far happened with the Latino vote in the twenty twenty elections? Well, thanks, David, and and thanks, Third Way, for hosting um, this conversation. Um, there are a few things I want to kind of point out as we kick things off here, and I'm going to share a slide here in a minute. But before I do, the, the kind of couple of things I just want to flag, um, and really, it's five things I think that we learned about the Latino vote this cycle. First is that um, Latinos proved to us what we have been saying for a very long time, which is we are not a monolith. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we should be dismissed as a group because we're so different. Um, but ultimately, because we have more in common than we do not. Um, but this year really kind of proved that there's an ideological kind of spectrum and nuance that we really need to spend time better understanding. The second piece is that that it, at the same time, um, you know, Latinos paved the way or helped to pave the way for Joe Biden's victory um, to the White House and winning back the United States Senate, particularly in the Southwest. And I think that, you know, despite all that we have heard and all that has been opined about the Latino vote over the last um, many, uh, many weeks and months since the election, you know, there was no state for which Latinos lost uh, the election for Joe Biden. And I think that's really important for us to remember as we think about the narrative for the Latino vote. We helped to build a very critical blue wall um, in the Southwest, and it's an, a, an, a critical um, kind of uh, set of voters in the electorate that we have to continue investing in. The third piece, which is also true at the same time, which was there were increases in support for Trump, and uh, Republicans and Trump actively uh, played for the Latino vote in 2020. I know that's a little bit hard for us to believe that somebody who started his campaign in 2016 could actually have uh, an active, um, you know, approach to reach and engage Latino voters. Um, and they did. And what we fundamentally saw was among certain segments of the electorate, a baseline shift um, uh, toward Trump um, that existed not just in Texas and Florida, as we've seen reported in the press, but we've seen that shift occur in places like uh, New Jersey uh, and Massachusetts as well. And I think that that's a fundamental thing that we need to kind of take away is that while we saw a tremendous turnout in places like the Southwest, and again, that helped to build that blue wall, there was something that did shift the cycle that I think is really important for us to better understand that cut across geography, uh, in origin. And that's really where a lot of Equis' analysis is, is focused, um, which is trying to understand these shifts, uh, shifts toward Trump. I think the fourth thing we need to know about the Latino electorate in 2020 is that this unique combination of the moment in time we were in around COVID and the disproportionate impacts that the Latino community felt as essential workers and small business owners and the economy really was kind of a, a magic uh, elixir um, that we think potentially helped propel some of the support um, toward Trump and played you know, a leading role and maybe a leading culprit for some of this movement toward Trump. So again, we need to better understand. Um, and the fifth big takeaway, which I think is kind of a bottom line takeaway, which is that there may be larger swaths of Latino voters than we have assumed in the past. And I think that um, while we have seen some of these uh, you know, soft Trump voters potentially supporting him, you know, holding back in 2016 and coming and supporting Trump in 2020, they're still very um, swingy on issues like immigration. They're still very pro-immigrant. There's a lot of pro-immigrant sentiment, even among some of these soft Trump voters that I think we need to better understand. And so if there's, a, again, kind of a big takeaway, it's that you know there may be larger parts of this electorate that are, in fact, more true swing voters. The one side I did want to share to just kind of reiterate 
the point that I made on um, on where we saw this shift is, can you see my screen now? Great, which is to say that like this, this slide shows the movement from um, 2016 to 2020 in key demo in key geographic areas where you can see that fundamental shift from Clinton to Biden and what Trump to Trump did. And you can see in many places, you know, where Trump did exceptionally well and where the trend of, of, of movement toward Trump um, was accelerated in places like Florida uh, and South Texas. But on the but as I pointed out earlier, you also see in places like New Jersey and Massachusetts this fundamental shift as well. Now let's be super clear: like the shift in New Jersey and Massachusetts wasn't a swing of 20, 30, or 40 points, but it was enough to register to see that maybe there is something kind of going on across the country that we need to be paying attention to. Is really the difference between 92%. And 85 or 82 percent in a lot of these places, but again, it's enough for us to kind of raise our eyebrows and say there was something bigger going on here. The one silver lining on this slide is, of course, Arizona and Maricopa County, which we can see that again, because of many of the efforts that happened on the ground there to both address increased turnout of our base, our base Latino voters, but then also this focus on persuasion and persuading to turn out in the Latino community as well, we were really able to stem some of the movement toward Trump in a place like Maricopa County, which ultimately helped to put us over the top um, in winning back in winning that Senate seat and winning um, and winning the, the White House and putting Arizona finally in the blue column. So this is just kind of a little bit of a table setter in terms of this movement to Trump that we're seeing where we saw it. Um, we can continue and I'm happy to answer questions later on about why we think some of this movement happened and among who out, other subgroups that we saw this movement happen as well. Perfect. Uh, Matt, do you wanna jump in with your thoughts? Yeah, thanks. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you, David, for inviting us in Third Way. It's great to be with uh, Dan and Stephanie, um, two folks that we've worked uh, together with over the years. Um, and I'll start by um, saying for my, for me, the biggest uh, takeaway, I think, was the tremendous turnout growth and then the potential that we have to continue turning out uh, the electorate. So overall, there was about a 15, 1.5% increase in the national electorate, one of the largest increases we have seen in turnout for the whole country. The Latino vote was expected to increase by 30%, so doubling what we saw nationally. So against a backdrop in which we had gangbuster growth in turnout, people were motivated to vote on both sides, the Latino vote doubled that, a 30% turnout in four years. What we had to look forward to is that the national electorate is not expected to increase by 15% again in 2024. Um, in some cycles, the national electorate stays exactly the same as it did four years ago. Um, and so maybe the national electorate might grow by 5% to 2024, but the Latino vote has the capacity to grow by another 30% in 2024. So we could see two cycles in a row of massive growth. And so we need to be doing uh, more understanding and uh, introspection and looking at those new voters. Who are they? They're overwhelmingly young. Uh, so the, the electorate is growing by people under the age of 35, especially by people under the age of 25, uh, by hundreds of thousands um, in, in um, many states. In Texas, for example, there's about 750,000 high school student Latinos, US born, who will be eligible to vote in 2024 that could not vote in this election that we just had, 750,000 just high school students who will be 18, 19, 20, 21. So the electorate is growing and that's something that we're all going to continue observing and watching and understanding. Those new voters are not automatic voters for the Democratic Party. Uh, they do trend um, more likely to be Democratic voters, but, but many of them are also telling us no party affiliation, decline to state independent. They're still trying out the two parties, seeing which party fits. Uh, and so there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for all of us um, in reaching out to new voters. The second class of new voters are of course naturalized citizens. And so the community is growing. Uh, we've seen an increased uh, interest in naturalizing during the Trump years in response to his policies, but there was also a bottleneck 
There was a purposeful slowing down through either increasing fees, taking the number of people out of the administrative process. And so naturalizations have been difficult. And we expect just with streamlining and just a more professional uh, Department of Homeland Security and Immigrations um, that we will continue to see those naturalizations of current existing legal permanent residents um, grow our electorate. So the electorate is going to keep growing and it's going to keep growing in key states. It's going to keep growing in Arizona. It's going to keep growing in Georgia. North Carolina is a state that had some of the fastest four-year growth of any state uh, in the country. And so that's the first thing that I'm looking at. I'm trying to diagnose where is the Latino vote growing? What are we saying and doing as we reach out to uh, this new electorate? Um, just, and, and so that for me is, is the biggest headline. Um, you know, a couple of points, I think, back to, you know, Stephanie's um, observations about the changes in the electorate. The first was, and I saw we had a, a question in the chat already, uh, Stephanie made the point that nowhere was the change in the Latino vote uh, responsible for the electorate. And someone asked about Florida. And, you know, Donald Trump carried Florida by 371,000 votes this cycle. He expanded his margin. And one of the things that's true is that he expanded that margin everywhere, not just with Latinos. Um, we have estimated, and I think that Carlos and Stephanie have estimated Florida as well, that in South Florida, the Latino change, which was substantial, accounted for about 109,000 net shift towards Trump in Florida. So that would leave another 260,000 votes uh, that Trump shifted independent of the Latino shift in South Florida. So while there was a shift there, it was uh, important in understanding Florida 26 and 27. Um, it was not responsible uh, for the change in what happened in Florida. There's a lot more work to do in a state uh, like Florida uh, in turning that back around for Democrats than only addressing uh, the issue of Latino voters in Miami-Dade County, which all of us here want to address and understand. Um, but some of that early reporting that came out did make us feel that way that uh, a couple of Cuban precincts in Miami somehow changed the entire state of Florida. And now that we have the data, we know that that's not the case. There was a larger issue uh, happening across the state. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear as we think about uh, what had happened. Um, I'm gonna leave it at that, uh, turn it over to Dan for his opening comments. Thanks so much. Thanks, Stephanie, for those great slides and getting us started. Thanks, Matt. Well, it, it's it's wonderful to be up, um, I guess, on stage um, on Zoom with, with, with this great crop, uh, this great group of people. Um, and third way has always just been tremendous with as, as a partner um, over the last couple of cycles as I've gotten to know them. So I'm just really honored to be here. Look, I, I will be really brief. I, I, I think, um, you know, it, it was interesting. We, we as, as, a, as a firm and as a team, we had races throughout the Southwest and really across the country. And it was amazing to me how many national folks as we started to talk about strategy and we started to really look at, at the 20 cycle, when we would mention Trump was on Spanish language, when we would mention the Republican Party had come into New Mexico on Spanish language, when we would, would talk about what we were seeing on YouTube, there was almost this, that, that's, not, that's not an important thing. Like that's not gonna work. Like that's smoke and mirrors. Of course they're doing it. Where else are these voters gonna go? And, 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 and while I, I, I couldn't echo more with what Stephanie said that, that the, in particular, the entire Southwest just over the course of the last you know, 20 years has changed so much and become such a, a place where Hispanics really, really create a base of support for the Democrats that is, is, is remarkable compared to where it was in the early 2000s. There is this degree within the party and, and I think within our, our own strategists that we have to really understand that, that Donald Trump sort of putting out a surround sound mechanism where he was communicating to Hispanics and Latinos. I use the word interchangeably. I hope folks are comfortable with that. But, but, but you know, in particular, his ability to talk to all of these Hispanics and move them. I think what happened in Florida is, is sort of an asterisk. I think there were a series of things that made Florida slightly more unique than than, than sort of the non-Florida portion of the, of the country. But, but it really should be a lesson for the Democrats that, that if you want to be able to move a larger group of the persuadable Hispanics, then it really is something that I think we need to think about. Because if you just think about who the Hispanic voter is for a second, and you just remove the word Hispanic, and you, you just think about them as a voter, right? Incredibly patriotic. A vast majority of them do have an immigrant story, but it doesn't always drive why they do what they do have an enormous amount of appreciation for small businesses, entrepreneurial spirit, the independent American spirit. And that's true, <laughs> that's true regardless of what corner or what ocean you're touching, you know, 
Um, the vast majority of them identify with some sort of religious organization. Um, 50% plus of Hispanics across the country own a home, which make issues around law and order and crime and those types of things incredibly important to them. And, and as we saw in, in, in with Hispanics across Nevada, the idea that you're there to really chase an American dream, to buy a home, to, to educate your children and really move forward in a way, those are things that they have an awful lot in common with white non-college educated voters. They have an awful lot in common with a whole other series of persuadable voters. And I think it would really behoove the party, and this is why it's so great that Third Way and others are, are, are asking these kinds of questions now, to really come up with, with our own version of a surround sound program where we're talking to Hispanics and we're thinking through, in particular, now that we control all three branches of government, how are we talking to Hispanics and Latinos across the country? How are we creating our own mechanisms for, for messaging that really create bite-sized opportunities for Hispanics to really understand in particular for those those online. I mean, this is this is where Hispanics go to get almost all of their information, um, and and how empower, how powerful influencers within the family and within the culture are is like a whole nother show. We could we could come back and talk about. But but those are some of my early ideas. And and again, I just can't stress how important it was. Why why did the electorate shift? Because Donald Trump put the money into it, and he had a good message. In particular, his economic populist message was incredibly powerful, and he chose to spend money and do it. It is not something as a party we should brush aside. It is, I think it's a really important lesson and happy to be here. Thanks again. Thank you, Dan. The next question is going to address something that Stephanie mentioned earlier about the fact that the Hispanic community is obviously not a monolith. Uh, Matt, I'm going to throw it over to you first before everyone else jumps in. When you hear someone say the Latino vote, in what ways do you think this group exists as a cohesive voting bloc? And in what way should people be aware of any divisions or differences, depending on who you're talking to and where they are located in the country? Well, I think that we, we, you know, the three of us and others are all of our colleagues that were on, um, you know, WhatsApp and signal chains with have been talking about this for a while. We've been seeing this and understanding this. Um, you know, for a long time. So I'm glad that this conversation is out in the mainstream now and that people are looking. We should be talking about Latino voters, Hispanic voters, not the Hispanic vote or the Latino vote. And, um, you know, the easiest example is that, you know, anyone would have known, like, yes, there are differences in, in Florida. That's just a, a small example of what we're looking at. I always remind people that if you had looked at the election returns in just the state of Vermont on election night and saw 68% of white people voting for uh, the Democrat, would you say, wow, look at this new trend in the white vote? No, you would say this is an interesting state, a geography, a, a region uh, that's liberal and has different standings. And so we should look at Latinos in the same light. And as Stephanie mentioned earlier, there is still continues to be more that Latinos say binds them together culturally, um, and linguistically, and just in terms of issues and worldview uh, as an immigrant-derived uh, community looking at opportunity in America. Um, but it doesn't mean that there aren't different, both geographic, national origin, and ideological views. And so I hope that what comes out of this cycle is more uh, segmenting within the Latino community and trying to understand what moves and what is important to different uh, groups. I think if we do that, uh, you're going to see much, much better outreach and, and reactions. And I'll say without you know, giving too much um, of, of a plug for the excellent work, Dan, that you did in 2018, I think um, you know that's a lot of what we were doing in that cycle. That's not that far ago, 2018, that we thought we had a really tremendous cycle with Latino voters. Uh, and that was because groups were doing different research in California, in Texas, in Florida, and understanding those communities differently. And I think if you do that and then treat them with that outreach, um, you will see that, yes, people still respond to being Latino, to Hispanic, uh, but they want to talk about issues in their community through their lens. Um, and, um, and that's really the, the secret sauce. It's not that difficult. Um, all of us have talked about it before. I would just add that, um, well, as my co-founder would, would say and often says that 
uh, we do have more in common with them. We don't uh, than the, what divides us as a Latino community. We are a people united by heritage, but divided by beans. Um, and so every subgroup of Latinos like has a different kind of beans as we do a different dialect of Spanish. Um, I will attribute that to Carlos, but um, I, I completely agree with Matt. And I really like the, that, that framing Matt that we shouldn't be talking about the Latino vote, but rather Latino voters, because fundamentally what we have found in this election is that there are a lot of assumptions we made that if we turned out a Democratic vote or if we turned out a Hispanic voter that that Hispanic voter would be a Democrat. Well, we've at least seen in places like South Texas, and this is the work and the analysis we're going to continue to do, is that wasn't necessarily the case. The people who we saw modeled in what would be considered a Democratic score were people that turned out for Trump this cycle. And so there's like this squishy middle. And I think just to you know take what Matt said just a step further, if there's one takeaway from this panel it is that we should be approaching Latino voters with the same level of curiosity, resources and investment that we have white swing voters over the last 10 years. Because this one is a trajectory of the future of population and electorate growth in this country. And two, again, what has been confirmed to this cycle is that we are not a monolith and there's enough ideological diversity to understand and softness for which is completely and totally persuadable. Like I think Latino voters are fundamentally one of the last group of true swing voters in this country. And they are actually, you know, less formed partisan identity as Matt talked about. We can talk a little bit more about who the soft Trump voter is later, um, but they are there for the taking. And I think what has happened over the last many years is Republicans have been asleep at the wheel since George Bush made the last real attempt for the Latino vote. He did not have social media at his side. Donald Trump did. And now we had the first time where, where, where Republicans made a real good faith effort to reach Latinos and spend real money and invest in real tactics to reach base. some of them disinformation and misinformation included that helped to reach and engage Latinos in a very real way that helped move people to Trump. The policy was there and I think to an extent like the policy was there, but I think we have on the progressive and democratic side have equal policy chops and a policy case to be made, especially now with the work that the Biden administration is doing on the economy, supporting small businesses. Like there is a case that we can go make to Latino voters. The question is like, are we going to make that case with the level of investment? And again, trying to understand who we're communicating that to, um, to reach them. I just want to echo, I, I loved Stephanie's point there about, about the party really taking the time to invest and understand the, the various pieces and, and, and thought processes that go into the Latino voter. I guess it's sort of Matt's, it's, it's, a, it's a Latino voter sort of series of thoughts here, but, but uh, and, and spending the time doing the research and spending the time thinking about it. I am a big believer that, that an awful lot of what drives the Hispanic and Latino vote is a sense of independent business, American dream sort of creation and chasing and that that's different everywhere right like if you want to if you really want to know why we struggled in the Rio Grande Valley you know the party's going to have to have a really hard conversation about how it views oil and gas jobs if you want to have a conversation about perhaps why we lost in 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 some of the well a big chunk of the non-cuban vote in 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 Florida we're going to have to have a conversation about origins of country the role government plays in things and what the word socialism really means to a whole bunch of different people in particular hispanics um, and it just it changes things. And remember, most Hispanics in the country own a home. They're incredibly tax sensitive, right? The idea of what goes into their hardworking money um, and, and what goes into their property tax and what goes into how they protect that home is incredibly important. Um, and it's then compounded by the fact that they want to send their kids to a good school. So all of a sudden, you're more susceptible to some of the other Republican arguments about, about taxation and about schooling. So anyway, that's just that's big picture pieces, but I'm a big believer in, in the early economic frames and really customizing those across the country. Um, and I couldn't agree more with what Stephanie's talking about right now. Like we have an ideal opportunity to be able to take the recovery plan, really talk about what that means for Hispanic and Latino families and businesses across the country. I, I think that's a really great point. Yeah. Dan, you actually just addressed what my next question was going to be. And if there's a single part of the American Rescue Plan that President Biden and our Democratic Congress passed that you would tell a congressional candidate to sell to Latino voters in their district, what would be that part of the American Rescue Plan? Well, 
I would tell a congressional candidate and anybody out there, it will, actually an elected official, to take the next six months to eight months and just spend a whole lot of time talking about this and explaining it to folks, because I think it's really important. First and foremost, the genesis of the payment right now is incredibly important, um, and, and ensuring that they understand where that money came from, how it's going to impact people's lives. And then again, I'm going to just echo Stephanie's point. There is an entrepreneurial spirit and appreciation that Hispanics have that's also then balanced by sort of this populist economic argument that Trump did a phenomenal job with, Bernie Sanders did a phenomenal job with, that, that Hispanics really hear across the country. Um, and, and, and I think that small business piece of what is coming, I think, is incredibly important. The small business, to, I'm sorry, the, the, the child tax credit, things that make it easier for you to move your family forward. We've got things that we can talk about as the calendar progresses really over the next 18 months that I think this act is going to have an awful lot to do with. Um, and 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 so so I think those would be my three sort of early big pieces of it. Can I just weigh in here with like a, a little anecdote from one of our recent focus groups um, that we did in January? I think this was from Nevada. Um, but this kind of just goes to show one, like the impact that this um, uh, pandemic had on, on Latinos, again, as essential workers, but also as like the, the small business startup business, you know, job creators that they are and entrepreneurs that they are in many communities across the country. Um, this guy says, we have to help the families that have businesses. La Tiendita de la Esquina, the corner store. They work hard and they've been hurt. The big companies have been making so much money, Amazon, like the big stores. So again, like they are seeing this like really important need to kind of help that, that, that the, the community, you know, corner store. This was somebody who, again, was a soft Trump voter who's worried about socialism, um, is concerned about helping and is probably happy that there are PPP loans helping that little corner store. Um, so again, I think there's like a lot of unpacking, but he said he was concerned about socialism. So not to say PPP loans or socialism, because they're obviously not, but that kind of government assistance um, to small businesses is the kind of thing that even, you know, that, that's, that, that soft Trump voters like really see uh, value in. And so I think we have to do so much work on working to get, you know, the American Rescue Plan and making, you know, creating that feedback loop for voters around who made this happen. It was a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate, and President Biden that made this happen. And I think that again, we've got plenty to work with on that front to again create our own and uh, our own kind of compelling narrative on the economy. Because I think among Latino voters, again, from our focus groups. They want to see Democrats and Biden deliver, um, you know, uh, so we have to create like this differentiation that, you know, again, just like negative attacks on the GOP being bad is not going to be enough. Um, you know, the issue of the economy for them is actually both about security and opportunity. So it's about like, how do we get out of this pandemic and avoid another shutdown? Um, and at the same time, create proactive opportunities um, for growth. Um, and so I think on the economy, there's just so much for us, um, so much for us to work with. Perfect, thank you. Um, on, on the same vein of what you're seeing in these focus groups, are there any are there any things that you're seeing that are huge red flags that Latino voters are hurting right now that a Democratic Congress is going to need to address in the future? Yeah. Maybe something like rising gas prices raising cost of childcare, anything like that. And, and really wanna open this up to everyone. I'll just start by saying immigration. Like there are super, super high, and again, among these soft Trump voters um, as well, um, you know, super high expectations around action for immigration. There's high salience and awareness about the Biden immigration plan. There's high awareness that Democrats control Congress and the White House. And so, you know, I think there is a big demand and threshold question around what Democrats are going to do, do and how they are going to deliver on this. I think the message that we're seeing resonates is this country has done so much for us and we've done so much for this country as the kind of messaging that resonates around immigration. But just to say like bottom line, like just because folks may be what we're seeing like slightly more um, I don't even want to say conservative, but leaning toward Trump on issues like the economy, again, doesn't mean that they are like anti-immigration. In fact, again, there is like a high um, demand and um, expectation for Democrats and Biden to deliver on something on immigration. I'll jump in next on that um, and say that I think part of what we've learned 
on um, <clears throat> where where Trump made inroads, and I think Dan explained this well, um, wasn't that they were necessarily leaning towards Trump in terms of that issue, like wanting a conservative message on that, is that they wanted attention to that issue um, of the economy and of reopening. And I think Democrats thought that we had a message that people agreed with in that let's be safe, let's make sure that you know, we're following the science, which people would tell us they agreed with. Uh, but what we, I think, miscalculated was the just the absolute salience of wanting to get the business back up, wanting to get the kids back in school. And so I think those are the, the next things that still remain on the um, horizon, David, is, and I totally agree with everything on immigration. I think you're going to see action, uh, and I think that will be much deserved. Uh, and that the Democrats will need to take credit for that action. But on these other issues, we still need to make sure schools reopen. And, you know, is there going to be indoor dining is, you know, how is that reopening going to happen in a way that helps people get back on their feet? Um, and um, childcare and school situations are ones that we see a lot continuing to be a discussion point uh, in the Latino community of, of you know, we're, we're very much younger. We're in the you know, um, elementary school uh, child area and everyone has kids at home. Are they going to go back to school? What's going to happen? Whether or not Trump mishandled this nine months ago, it's now for the Democratic Party to address going forward, including working with some Republican governors of states um, in Arizona and Florida and places that, you know, may not uh, share our urgency on the messaging. Uh, and so um, just continuing to listen to people about what they want to hear about uh, I think is going to be important. And whether it's gas prices or something else, as Stephanie said, uh, we now control uh, the the federal government and you know we have an obligation to address those issues. Perfect. Um, and there's a question that we're getting a little bit uh, in the chat about, and I want to make sure we address it. Um, a lot of candidates, consultants, and vendors really sweat this one out. Maybe even leave, they lose a little bit of sleep over it. But how would you try to address this community, Hispanic, Latino, Latinx? Does it change depending on who's saying it, whether it's coming from a member of the community or an outsider trying to be an ally? And I can start by throwing this one to Matt. Yeah, so we always ask this question in all of our polls. And our objective is to address people in the way that they themselves prefer to be addressed. And so we always ask at the beginning, um, you know, do you consider yourself of Hispanic, Latino, Latin American, Chicano? We throw out a lot of terms at the beginning just to screen people into the survey. Um, but then once we get them in, the very first question we ask is, what term do you prefer? Um, and we, we give all those sort of options. And my advice is always for people to, you know, be uh, fluid, to use the terms that people themselves uh, like so once we find out if you prefer the term Hispanic for the rest of the survey or for the rest of the focus group we'll talk to you you know through that term so that you feel like we're talking about your community that you're a member of um, and I think that's you know sort of the best just in terms of you know data and takeaways and a lot of people have asked this question we still get you know by a good healthy two to one margin uh, Hispanic is still preferred in the community over Latino or Latina uh, and then, you know, some people still prefer to really only think of themselves in their national origin group. Um, and then, you know, the term Latinx is one that I think has opened important dialogues, but it is still small within the actual community, within the everyday people using it to refer to themselves or their community. So I usually advise people, if you're trying to talk to the audience as a whole, not to use the word Latinx um, only because some people may not think that that applies to them. They think you're talking about someone else. They don't understand it yet as an umbrella term. Uh, it usually only comes in around 3% of people who prefer that as their main uh, identity. So again, I, I think talk to people, you know, the term they, they prefer. You're probably not going to make any huge errors if you use Hispanic or Latino or even Latinx. Uh, but we always let, you know, let, let the community decide how they want to be identified. Yeah, and, and, and I would just add, especially if you're working with candidates, um, you know, my, my, my father was, was a New Mexican who was raised in Mexico City, who ran a business, was a father, was a husband. He was a New Mexican first and foremost, through and through. And so my real suggestion is, is to sort of go back to some of the earlier parts of this, where you begin to think about 
the Hispanic community as voters and types of people that have a series of preferences and views of the world and, and spend the time on that. And then whether you're calling them New Mexicans or Floridans or dads or moms or small business owners or neighbors, that, that part is much easier. I think if you can cross the value statement with this group of people first, then they're pretty much going to listen to anything you want to say. The one thing I would just add is, yeah, a final point to that, which, um, you know, about the word Latinx, I agree with everything Matt and Dan said, and our research has confirmed the same, you know, I think if you ever look at the word Latinx again, I'd ask you to look at it with the X and thinking about, which is the origin of our name, the X representing Latinos or Hispanics being the X factor in politics and society moving forward. And that X factor that we need to understand, which is the root of our name, X is the letter X in Spanish, um, which, you know, again, we're not suggesting that people, you know, go rebrand an entire community using the word Latinx, but rather what the X represents, which is this uncertainty and curiosity uh, and need to understand um, a part of our population in the electorate that um, is gonna be really cr critical moving forward. Thank you. I think that's going to help a lot of people. <laughs> um, so thinking about 2022, the elections that are going to be coming up sooner than I think we all want to admit, um, what would you do uh, as if you were advising Democratic uh, candidates to persuade Latino voters, many of them, again, turning out for the first time in 2020, to make sure that they show up in 2022 and then choose Democratic candidates up and down their entire ballot. Uh, Dan, we'll start with you. Sure, well, first of all, I have an intentional strategy and communications plan to talk to them from day one. And, and sometimes that means something that's unique to the Hispanic community. And sometimes it just means that it's intentional in terms of the way you phrase it and put it together that's directed directly into the community, whether it's on Spanish TV or Spanish radio or, or sort of what the tactic is. But look, I, I, I think whether it's, it's Hispanics, Latinos, suburban moms and dads, sort of the, the core coalition of, of what makes the Democratic Party successful, I think is really gonna come down to three different things and all of the issues underneath them. And I think in the next 18 months, we're all gonna remember the day we get our shot. We're all gonna remember the day we go back to work and whether that means our office opens or we go back to work physically or we set a new schedule and we're gonna remember when our kids go back to school. And all of the issues, and, and, and I'm gonna use the word security and I don't mean security, Stephanie used it earlier, I don't mean national security issues. I mean the issues of security that under under that support every single one of those things are going to be absolutely critical, not only for this election, but probably for the next couple. And it's it's security around your job, it's security around your health, it's security around how you're going to pay for your health care, it's security around how your children feel when they're in school, it's your own personal security. Um, in the U.S. Capitol. I mean, there's just, I think the issues of youth security underneath all of those things are really going to drive. And I think the, the biggest one will be the economic security and the driver about how comfortable am I moving forward in my life economically, regardless of a V-shaped curve, regardless of, of all of those other things. I think there is some, some psychological issues here that the country is going to have to deal with. Um, but I think those are the core frames right now that that um, that the Democrats probably also want to fight on, to be candid with you. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? I would just encourage people, I think there are kind of a, a couple of things that I would encourage folks to think about. One is, as I talked about earlier in, in modeling and how we, you know, try to predict who are going to be Democratic voters, I think there's a fundamental flaw and how we maybe think about that and who we put in persuasion universes versus turnout universes. And I think is, you know, kind of a meta point of, of this presentation is around, you know, Latinos being more of a persuasion audience um, than we may have been led to believe. So I think there are kind of big issues we need to think about with regard to modeling and the universes that we're bringing in and targeting in, in our models. Um, and then I think, you know, to Dan's point and how they're kind of built in and baked in from day one into field digital and communication strategy, this is not just a turnout game, but how do we communicate the message of persuasion? And then third, which is less maybe in the candidate space, but I think more broadly, like where are people actually getting their news and information? And how are we finding there's, you know, rampant dis 
misinformation that we saw happening in 2020. Um, you know, people, especially in the Latino community, I think it's 63% of all Latino voters are getting their new, getting some of their news and information from YouTube. I think that number is like over 72 or 75% in Florida. So the role that like YouTube is playing and what we saw in our most recent poll in, in, in Nevada is of the new Trump voter in 2020, the soft Trump voter in Nevada, more of them were getting their news and information from YouTube than Fox News. So these aren't people who are watching in, you know, and again, when stuff like January 6 happens or other major news events happen, or they want information on COVID and the vaccines or something they saw came across online or via WhatsApp, they're going to YouTube and searching for it and finding a video. So it's, it's our job to make sure that there are good videos and good content out there with good news and facts rather than what we have seen on there, which is, you know, a Trump um, and conservative kind of ecosystem of media channels like PragerU has a whole vertical targeting Latinos. We saw Alex Otayola in South Florida, a YouTube influencer kind of totally backed by the conservative kind of establishment that really like is very um, uh, uh, influential influencer in South Florida. So those are the kind of things that I think we need to also be thinking about beyond the kind of X's and O's of like traditional campaigning. Let's add on issues, you know, for campaigning, I would absolutely, you know, get out in front on the ARP on the rescue plan. Um, I think those key points, Dan hit it well, he's run a campaign or two in his time, you know, the, the day you got your shots, your stimulus check, when it arrived, your business loan, maybe doing some events around those, um, you know, meeting with Latinos who are getting that PPP business loan that they missed out on the one from last year. Because to Stephanie's point, the big companies sucked up all the loans and the airline sucked up all the loans and the mom and pop didn't get it. Talk about those issues. The rescue plan is incredibly popular, incredibly popular, up and down the issues in it. Just get out there and talk about that and say, we did that. You did that. Um, and that's why we need to you know, return you to Congress, return you to uh, the Senate, et cetera, is because of that backing there. And I think there's also a chance perhaps on some of the executive orders uh, that the president has already issued on immigration, um, on TPS for Venezuelans, putting that into effect is incredibly popular on uh, clarifying, you know, what's going to happen with child separations and, and, and not taking uh, children away from their parents. Those sorts of things are popular. We just need to message on it. We remind people that we're doing this. Um, but, you know, the rescue plan, I think Dan laid out at the very start of this call, you know, should just be something for the next six to nine months that, you know, we're hammering home because it's a good it's not all that we need, but it is a very good start uh, and it is going to help this country recover. Perfect. Well, I really appreciate all of your time today. Uh, I wish we could keep going forever, uh, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, for those of you that ask questions that we weren't able to address either uh, here in the chat or uh, in the Q&A chat bar on the side, uh, try to follow up uh, with you all. But again, thank you all. If anyone has any quick closing remarks, I'm sure everyone would appreciate to, to learn from them. Anyone? Okay. With the, Oh, Stephanie? No, I was going to invite Dan or Matt to go first. But... No. After you, Stephanie. <laughs> no, I mean, I think I, I'll just close where I started, which is to say that like um, I, you know, of, of all of the trends that we have seen, I just, I would urge all of us to approach this community and constituency with the level of curiosity and resources and investment that we have of white swing voters. I think that Latinos are the new white swing voter of the next decade. Um, and uh, there's a lot more we've got to dig into. We have a laundry list of about um, 12 to 15 kind of hypotheses that we're digging into. What was the role of socialism? What was the role of disinformation? You know, um, what happened with gender? Was the college on college a dividing factor? So um, hopefully this was of interest to folks. I just would encourage people to um, go to ecisresearch.us or ecislabs.us, sign up for our distribution lists and, and you know, you can stay in touch with us, follow us on Twitter. Um, we're always providing um, hot takes um, uh, on the Latino vote, um, just to make sure that like, again, we're, we're thinking about this and integrating kind of this new view and strategy into our plans for the midterms, but also for kind of the longer haul, not just four years from now, but really the next, you know, 10 years and beyond. Dan, any thoughts? Closing remarks? 
I think Stephanie said it great. It's then it's been an honor and just a real joy to be up here. I think Stephanie said it great. Just, and it's the last thing, last thing I'll add is just, you know, don't get too uh, up or down about any particular election. Um, you know, we, we still don't know, as Stephanie said, exactly how much of this was just a Donald Trump effect. Um, the same way we didn't know in 2016 when we thought we had a good Latino turnout and good Latino support was a Donald Trump effect. Um, we, we had a great election in 2018. And, you know, we could, with proper investment, you know, have a great election for the Democrats in 22. So uh, these are all things that are, um, that are changing and fluid. And that's, that's the reason, because we have such a new electorate, so many first time voters, that's the reason Stephanie is calling the Latino electorate the most persuadable because they're new, we're new, we're young, we're naturalized citizens, we're first time voters. So keep investing and it will pay off. Perfect. Thank you all. Everyone have a great rest of your week. That's it from us.